Thanks for coming to my talk. Um, so I'm talking about gene drives and stochastic dynamics of gene drives in space and how it's actually quite hard to suppress populations in practice. So I don't need to talk too much detail about how important malaria is and, it, and the burden it has on population in sub-Saharan Africa. So it'd be very nice to be able to find a way of controlling and suppressing uh, mosquitoes that carry malaria. So one way to do that is by using um, suppression gene drives, which were um, thought of by um, Austin Burt a few years ago. And so gene drives basically force super Mendelian inheritance onto uh, using a trait which is deleterious into a population using drive, as it were, as we see here. Um, um, but one of the biggest barriers to doing this successfully is the evolution of resistance. So how exactly does the suppression drive work? So if we have a heterozygote for a particular drive construct, which is a genetic intervention, uh, normal Mendelian inheritance would give you half-half gametes and gametogenesis, but the drive acts to cut this wild type, um, and then it's repaired by homologous direct repair um, to turn it into a drive. And so a very large fraction of the gametes are produced that are produced are uh, this drive type. And so even if it's deleterious, it's driven into the population. Um, and so what the idea to use this is to then drive this into a very conserved gene, which is very important for the organism. So in Ophelia's Gambi, one of the carriers of malaria in sub-Saharan Africa, there's a double sex gene, which is highly conserved, and it's essential for female fertility. Um, it only affects female fitness, and the heterozygotes have a small fitness cost, right? And so that's important because if the heterozygotes have a small fitness cost, it can allow it to penetrate into the population and go up in frequency a certain amount. And once you get lots of uh, homozygotes, that should crash the population. And this is what you see in cage experiments here. So this is drive frequency versus generations, and it goes up in frequency. And at the same time, the egg output goes down and the population crashes. But of course, populations in cages are not the same as populations in sub-Saharan Africa. So there's billions of mosquitoes, most likely. So in practice, it's a population rescue problem. So can um, the populations adapt before they're basically uh, removed and develop resistance? Um, and so one way by which resistance can arise is by non-homologous end joining. And so that's basically when, once the wild type is cleaved, instead of going on to homologous direct repair, there's a small fraction that becomes um, basically goes through this non-homologous end joining route and you get some sort of um, indel or something, which is most likely going to be deleterious, but some small fraction might be um, functional and give you resistance. Um, and so we expect this beta, this beta parameter here, the fraction to be functional to be very small. But so if you do simulations of such a thing, you find that this is what happens. Basically, you remove the wild type, which is in red, the drive goes up in frequency, which is in um, yellow, but before it completely goes to fixation, we have a resistance muta mutation that arises and then takes over the population and rescues the population, as we see here. So these are discrete time simulations based on Lille frequency and Beverton Holt dynamics, sort of right, pseudo right fission models with a coupling of population dynamics. And this is published in lots of detail, and particularly looking at the multiplexing case uh, a couple of years in, um, ago in PNAS. Right, so today's topic, though, is going to be about what happens, though, these, these are well-mixed models, right? Completely panmictic, well-mixed models. So what happens in practice? Because mosquitoes can obviously move, right? So this is our space. We have these uh, grid or deems, and they can move between deems, between generations. So what happens? So if we can, so this is a research assistant which did the simulations, and it can't start yet. Right, so this is the start, it's slightly further in, so you can see what's going on. And so this is the popula total population size. White means nothing, there's no population, wild type frequency and dry frequency. And what you can see is they have this sort of stochastic traveling wave phenomenon where the drive frequency, the drive basically chases the wild type around the uh, um, population, around the um, area. And this persists for a very, very long time, okay? And if things persist for a long time, then that means there's a chance that resistance can arise, okay? And this is quite interesting just from a purely phenomenological phenom point of view as well, right? So there's no resistance in these simulations, just to be clear. 
population persists, and it's, this, and it's been termed chasing this particular phenomenon, uh, where basically, um, yeah, the wild type can basically persist by colonizing empty space, and then it takes drive some time to catch up and then suppress it again, and it keeps going and going and going. And it only happens at small population densities. Right? So it's quite a new sort of phenomenon, I think. And so we see this in practice. So if you look at the probability of chasing as a function of carrying capacity per deem with a population density, we, see, we do indeed see that large carrying capacities, it diminishes and goes to, um, the probability of chasing goes to zero. So how can we explain this? Um, so one thing you can do is do something, you can look at the, one thing you can do is look at the power spectrum of the fluctuations. So you basically look at the frequency content of the fluctuations at different scales of frequency, and you get these two different types of signatures. So if you've just got poor drive, you get an equilibrium between wild type and um, drive, and you just get these normal fluctuations, and you see that it has a particular power law. But once you've got drive chasing happening with a high efficiency drive, you see the fluctuations diminish far more quickly, and there's actually a peak in the um, oscillate in the um, power spectrum. A peak in power spectrum indicates a oscillatory sort of behavior. Right, so if you now add in end joining into this, um, like I said before, when we redo those simulations, you see again that the population persists. It's not just removed. Uh, these are non-functional resistant mutate, mutate, mutants. These are uh, functional resistance mutations, drive and wild type. And what you sort of see is this like frothy sort of C type of chasing going on, which is distinct from what happened before. And eventually resistance arises and takes over the population, spreads and takes over the population. So if the population persists over time, it's not a question of if resistance will arise, but a question of when it will arise. An important question is the duration of protection, yep, in this case. And the nature of the chasing now has changed to a different sort of type. And you can see this by looking at the exponent of the power spectrum, and it looks more like around minus four, minus three. And what you see is if you do a phase diagram of the current capacity versus this n rate, the rate of producing these non-homologous end-joining mutants, and non-functional mutants, um, you see that actually it pushes the um, threshold at which the current, the current capacity capacity threshold at which this chasing phenomenon happens. So it goes to higher carrying capacities. And so the one idea might be that perhaps these N alleles are providing protection to the wild type to stop it being diminished so quickly and it then allows it to persist at higher population sizes. So the fluctuations aren't so important. Right. Okay. How am I doing for time? I haven't heard a ding yet, so I think it's okay. I think I'm going too quickly now. Okay, so how do we theoretically try to analyze such a thing? So I have a very talented um, research assistant who just graduated in theoretical physics from Cambridge, and she was tasked with looking at this sort of thing. And so what we you can do is something called a master equation approach. Um, where essentially what you do is write down reactions of this drive process using birth death processes. Uh, and the drive, and there's no resistance at the moment. And so what you have is, you say, in a given patch of space, or a DEEM, I, I have a reaction, which is basically a com combination of viability selection and mating. And so in order for these two genotypes, so wild, um, WW being two wild-type um, copies, and then WD being the uh, heterozygote, in order for them to reproduce, they need to do that into empty space, okay? Right, so you then have to track the number of empty spaces in your DEEM. And then you say, and that's in the i patch, and that happens at a certain rate. And then the result is you leave an offspring of WW, or you might leave an offspring of WD, right? And that happens in proportion one minus epsilon or one plus epsilon. And then the viability part comes in by multiplying by the fitness of the um, basically the female in this case. It's slightly more complicated, but I'm brushing over the details. And then you have migration simply by saying, okay, I, in order for me to migrate, um, there has to be an empty, empty space in an adjacent DEEM J. 
And so we go, we have the rate of WWI plus EJ going to EI, because you can leave it empty space once you leave, um, going to WWJ, um, and so and so forth for, for the other um, genotypes. And then you have this horrendous thing which you write down. It looks like a differential equation. It's different, it is a differential equation, but it's a differential equation in terms of the numbers of individuals. So you're actually looking at what's the probability of increasing, say, NWW by 1, so from NWW minus 1 to NWW, or NWW to NWW plus 1, and so on, similarly for all the other um, genotypes. And then what you... And then there's this whole machinery from statistical physics, which you can use, which is basically called stochastic field theory. And what you try to do is to figure out what's the mean field behavior, what's the effective deterministic behavior of these equations, okay? Um, so you end up with ODEs or PDEs in space. And, and then you want to calculate the fluctuations around that mean field behavior. Um, and that gives you the power spectrum of the fluctuations. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details, but just show you that once you do this for this particular set of reactions, you get this PDE. So you can write down, you can try to write down a PDE for drive. This is a bit more first principled way of doing it. You start from this mass equation and you write down this uh, PDE and you get this diffusion term and then you get this logistic type term here and you have a similar thing for all the other two, two different genotypes. And then what she did, what Connie did, was then say, okay, let's try and match. Let's just see if it matches the discrete time simulation we do. And um, we can see qualitatively for different values of this drive, um, the um, epsilon, the efficiency of the cleavage rate of drive, um, that qualitatively we get very, you know, reasonably good agreement between the two. We shouldn't expect it to be quantitative, but we, the qualitative dynamics to be correct at least. And if you, try, if you solve the, those PDEs now using a numerical method, and you start off with drive in, I didn't say that, so you start off with drive in one corner, you got the wild type in, in, across the whole space, of course. Let me do that again, that was a bit quick. And you see this perfectly removes, as you might expect, the, it perfectly removes the, um, uh, the wild type. And no, there's nothing, you know, Nothing, it doesn't sound very surprising. The key thing is that we need the fluctuations, right? So if you've got, you go to this deterministic limit, you don't have, um, you don't have um, this persistent sort of stochastic phenomenon. So the key thing is that at low population densities, this wavefront of the drive is basically stochastic and it breaks up, which means that the, the wild type can essentially persist and then allow, um, give you fluctuations. And so, it suggests there's a long-term metastable state. So the fluctuations, unfortunately, she hasn't been able to calculate them yet. It's a very complicated thing to do. Um, but the idea is that what we're able to do eventually is to predict exactly what this carrying capacity is in terms of the parameters of the system uh, that we have. So, and then that will allow us to then explore the behavior further. And then, I haven't talked about it, but she's also looking at um, NHEG cases, which is even more complicated. So just thank Kieran Chopper who did the early simulations, Connie Sheeran and Austin Burt, my collaborator on this work. And All right. Um, I'm going to talk today about instability um, of phy in phylogenetic trees after taxon addition. Um, so the motivation of this project is um, online phylogenetic inference. So in the standard phylogenetic inference framework, you're given an, uh, a sequence alignment and you aim to infer a tree. The idea behind online approaches to this is that we have a sequence alignment and then we have new sequence arrive over time. So new, new sequences are added to our sequence alignment and we're wondering if we can, um, and we want to compute the tree for the new alignment, but instead of like using traditional me methods and inferring the tree from scratch for the whole alignment, we try to re reuse the tree that we've already computed for the smaller alignment. And one of the big questions is when you think about this for the first time, um, can we just add the new taxon somewhere in the tree at a good spot and are good? Or maybe does the underlying tree that we've already inferred change when we add sequences to the tree inference? A few algorithms for online inference already exist, but no one has really looked into this question of whether the tree changes or not. So this is what I'm talking about today. 
Um, if the tree does not change, we say that the inference is stable upon um, taxon addition. If the tree does change, we talk about instability. And with tree change, I mean change in tree topology. Um, here, so I don't worry about branch lengths. So we measure this stability, so this, this change in the infrared tree when adding a taxon, and we build like a, a framework to um, do this for a number of alignments. So the workflow that we have is we start with a, an alignment, and instead of adding a sequence, we just delete one to get a small alignment and then be able to kind of add the sequence back in to get the full alignment. So we uh, delete a sequence from the alignment, we infer a tree. I'm only talking about maximum likelihood inference um, for this project. Um, and we do this with IQ tree to get this, um, this tree there on the small alignment. At the same time, we also use IQ tree to infer the full tree that now contains this taxon that we just deleted. Um, and to be able to compare the two trees, we actually prune the taxon from the full tree. So we can then compute Robinson false distance, for example, to compare um, these two trees. The one at the top I um, refer to as infer tree. It's the tree inferred on a small alignment. And the one at the bottom is the prune tree, the full tree with the, with the taxon pruned from the tree. And we want to look at this on empirical data. So I'll just talk in a minute about the kind of data sets we look at. And uh, we take our alignments. And for every alignment, we, we delete each sequence once. So we do this. If we have n sequences, we do this thing n times. And we wanted to look at empirical data and see how often do we observe that these two trees change. Um, the data set that we took, we took from previously published paper by a different group. Um, Harrington et al., they had lots of alignments and a Bayesian inference on them, so we just decided we just take um, some of the data set that they curated. Um, I actually subsampled it because it was a bit too much for what I was doing, and ended up with 1,000 alignments and had varying number of taxa on the x-axis here and then varying number of sites, so we get like kind of diverse group of alignments, so lots of different things. These are all gene trees. Um, and uh, in all these 1,000 alignments together, we have almost 68,000 taxa, which means in my pipeline I need to use IQ2 to infer trees 68,000 times, which is a lot. So this is computationally quite heavy, and this is why we picked this sort of data set. So we look now at the distance between um, the infer tree and the prune tree, so the tree inferred on the smaller alignment and the, the larger one, basically. This is the Robinson Fultz distance normalized. So Robinson Fultz distance just measures the change in topology. If it's zero, then we have the same topology. And we do see a high bar here at zero. So um, in almost 8,000 cases, the Robinson Fultz distance is zero, and the tree does not change when we add the sequence um, to the inference. But that's actually only about 11% of our data set. So quite often we see that the tree does actually change. And the distances can get quite high. That's kind of a tail. Um, so the first conclusion here was, yes, this instability does exist when we add a taxon to a tree. We can't, like, we can't just add it to the tree. We need to modify the tree, basically. We were then also interested in seeing where exactly our tree changes. Um, so what we wanted to know is whether the changes in our two trees are local to where this new taxon sits in the, in the tree. So if we assume that here on the left we have our inferred tree on the small alignment, and on the right, the tree on the full alignment that has this um, extra sequence S. We wanted to look at the edges that are different between the two trees, so for example, the red edge here, and see how close it is to this added taxon S. And the idea um, is that potentially it's close to where the taxon sits because that might be where the taxon has most influence. So we were actually quite surprised when we saw that these distances tend to be quite high. There's again a high bar at zero. Those are the trees that have no difference between them, so they're included in that. Um, but generally, we see that the changes between the two trees can actually be quite far away from where this new taxon sits in the tree, uh, which was a bit of a surprise to us. But then what we looked at, and which seemed to make a bit more sense, for maximum likelihood inferences, we have bootstrap values. We know where in the tree, we are not sure about how the tree is resolved. And it seems likely that these edges that change when adding the taxon are close to uncertain regions where we don't really know what's, what's going on in the tree. So we looked at the distance of these changing edges to low bootstrap support edges. And with low bootstrap support, I mean less than 70%. Um, so we do this in the, in the smaller tree here on the left. And looking at those distances, we see that they're actually quite small. Um, so quite often, the edge itself has low bootstrap support, or it's very close to these low bootstrap support edges. Um, so 
this, um, the uncertainty in the trees is like something you really need to bear in mind when developing online methods for phylogenetic inference. And after observing all of this, we thought we could maybe go one step further and not only look at where the stability exists and where it is, but maybe we can predict whether it's going to happen or not. So we took our pipeline and added an extra step. We wanted to see if we can just use the the smaller tree that we already inferred for the small alignment and the small alignment and the new sequence without computing the full tree and design some summary statistics that could then inform us if we add this new sequence, is the tree going to change or not? So we wanted to predict whether the tree changes or not. Um, so we developed like a battery of summary statistics. I'm not going to talk about all of them because there were like, I think, 16 of them. Um, and we used random forests uh, to do this um, sort of prediction, so we trained a random forest, mainly because of the reason that it's kind of interpretable, so we can see which of our summary statistics had a huge influence on our predictions, and we classified, so we basically classified into the tree changes versus the tree does not change. Um, this is the performance, so this is the, the raw curve area under the curve of 0.85, which is not perfect, but we do catch some signal. <coughs> So it's somewhat predictable, at least with the summary statistics we have on our data with maximum likelihood. Um, and I want to point out um, two, two of our summary statistics that have, one of them has very high influence on the prediction, one has quite low influence. Um, so the one that was very important for a prediction apparently is the distance of the best taxon placement to low bootstrap support edges. So what does that mean? Um, taxon placement is something that we use for summary statistics. Um, so we basically took the tree that we already inferred on the smaller data set and just tried to add in the taxon at the best place in that tree we already had inferred. There are algorithms for this, evolutionary placement algorithms, and they're pretty efficient to compute, which was also one of our goals with the summary statistics. Um, so we can easily um, put the taxon in, and then that's the best tree, assuming that we have the space tree already. Um, and the distance of this insertion to a low bootstrap support edge was very informative of our predictions. So if it's close, this insertion is close to low bootstrap support edges, the tree is likely to change um, when, if we were comparing this tree to the uh, tree inferred on the full alignment. Um, and one um, summary statistic that was of low importance, which surprised us a little bit, is neighbor joining stability. So we kind of use exactly the same framework again, the same like alignment deleting the sequence and then inferring trees. But instead of maximum likelihood inference, we use neighbor joining, which is a distance-based method that just looks at the distances between sequences and reconstructs a tree from those. And looked at the Robertson Fultz distance between um, the two trees again and found that neighbor joining and maximum likelihood, like with the neighbor joining, instability does not mean that maximum likelihood, is, we also observe instability, so a, train, a change in the tree. Um, so these two different inference methods don't seem to be um, particularly closely related. So neighbor joining is not a good predictor of maximum likelihood. Whether this is also going to be the case for like maximum likelihood versus Bayesian inference or something like that. It's nothing we have looked at yet, but that will be interesting to know as well. Well, and even though there was no gong yet, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm through it. I would like to um, acknowledge my uh, collaborators and outside my group and um, funding agencies. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I should probably um, repeat for the recording. 
Um, so the question was if I um, could also look at distance measures between trees that incorporate edge lengths, because it could be that we like the, the changed edges are very short ones. Yeah, that's definitely um, something that we could do. Um, and we're aware that we're not looking at that. We're really only looking at topology changes here. Um, but yeah, that, that would be worth doing, yeah? Right. right. I, yeah, that, that does make sense. I think I have at some point looked at edge lengths and there's no edges of length zero, but I, I, I should check that again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? No, I'm using um, EPA and G. Okay, okay. Um, are, are P placers here from the same group? Yes, P placers from the same group. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. We have not looked at that yet, but that would definitely be very interesting to see. Like, if you add a bunch of sequences at once, or like just sequentially adding more and more sequences and see when the tree falls apart, basically. Yeah, that would be very interesting to do. I would also love to use viral data sets for this sort of thing. It's just computationally very expensive if you like do one taxon addition one after another to always recompute like compute the full tree. Um, but yeah, that's. Yeah, so we have actually um, performed tests to compare how good the inferred and the pruned tree are, like under maximum likelihood um, criteria. These, like uh, AU tests would do that. Um, so we have actually done that and saw that quite often the difference, or most of the time, um, the difference is not significant. So they're both pretty good trees. Um, so this is something to bear in mind, definitely, but still we observe this change in topology. But that's, that's a very good point. Should probably change up to the next speaker. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining me today to learn a little bit more about the cross-bracing approach that we use to estimate the age of the last universal common ancestor.